You know, one of the most common reasons why sales do not happen is because the salesman accepts the excuse that the prospect gives. That primary excuse is, you know what, everything sounds good, go ahead and send me some information and let me think about it. <laughs> or, all right, well, let me talk about it and I'll get back to you. And the reason why that is the number one killer of sales is because you and I know if you've been in sales for a while, they don't mean it. <laughs> They're not going to call you back, boo-boo. Those, those people are gone. They're ghosts. The second that that phone hangs up, they'd be like, who? <laughs> they, you know what I mean? They probably threw away the little napkin that they wrote your proposal on. Um, they probably went back to the TV show or, you know what I mean, went to the straight the, the list on, on DirecTV to go catch what they TV'd. They're on to the next thing. And, uh, and it's human nature that prospects react this way. And I want to share with you in this video why. But more importantly, I want to give you the solution so that you don't meet that objection at the very end. Because typically, you probably spend a good 30 minutes or more of your valuable time in presenting that information or presenting that proposal just to get snagged by that objection that is very common, right? Would you agree? Like you get that a lot. And even whether it's a cold call, whether it's a inbound or, or, or just a standard presentation, one of the most dreadful objections that we can get is, all right, well, go ahead and send me some information. Let me think about it. Because then we get stuck with, oh man. And then kind of our emotion peaks out and we're like, they're lying. I'm never going to hear from you. My boss is grinding me for, for a sold unit. You know, like I got a quota to hit. I just lost the deal. I need to make up for it. And so we got all these motions running through us and I don't want it to, to kill your momentum or kill your uh, you know, kill, kill your potential of being great. And so you're going to want to watch this full video and I'm going to share with you how to get past that objection. What's up everybody? Welcome back to Sales Remastered. My name is Daniel and I'm your host. On this episode of Sales Remastered, we're going to talk about the one dreadful objection that every salesman hates to hear is let me think about it. It's one of the most common objections and I believe it is the prospect's lame excuse on, on basically not wanting to hurt your feelings. Right, they they just don't want to tell you no, and uh, and 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 you know this is true because you might even do it yourself. Like you know when people when you go into a store, like let's say a, a sales store, if you've ever been on a car lot, and you're walking around, kind of just window shopping, right? And the salesman, you know, comes up to you and and they say, hey, can I help you? Can I help you find something? And your first response is, no, I'm okay. I'm just looking, right? Like even though you really do need help, you need to know what what you're looking for. You just don't want to be mean, right? Like say, no, I'm good. Right, like no, I don't want to be sold. That you, we just have these natural reactions. Or if you go to someone's house and they offer you something to drink, you know, sometimes instinctively, those those of us with manners will say, "No, I'm okay," even though we're really parched. <laughs> right? It's because it's human nature not to be an inconvenience. So we're raised this way, you know, from our from our adult from you know from our adults from our parents, and uh, and so we we want to be courteous. And so the same thing applies with our prospects. Like, have you ever called the prospect and maybe their kids answer the phone? And they say, mommy, daddy, someone's on the phone. And you hear him in the background. Who is it? And you're like, uh, some guy named Daniel. Oh, tell him I'm not here. Oh, my mom said I'm not here. <laughs> right? Like that's, you see what I'm saying? Like, like, like we would teach our kids to lie before we'll be inconsiderate, which is ironic, right? And so before that objection becomes the reason why you don't make your next uh, sale out of the of your next pitch. Let me go and give you a solution that I found work, and I'm going to use a reference or an example of a sale that I just made. You know, in in my industry, and I'm a salesman. I've been a salesman uh, for two decades now, and currently, right now, I sell over the phone. I don't sell in person, which some people could say, you know, is is a challenge, and some people could say, oh, that's easier than selling them in person. Whatever your views are on it, I I just know what what you know my experience and 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 what I could say is that selling someone over the phone is a little bit different than selling them in person because you can't necessarily see their body language, and prospects are more likely to lie to you. Like they'll say, "Oh, we're on our way out," when they're sitting on the couch, you know, <laughs> about to turn on the TV, or "Oh, you know what? I got guests over. Ain't no one home, right?" Like so, they're, they're, it's very easy to give you an excuse. Whereas if you're there in person. You know, you could tell because you could see with your own eyes. Anyway, I have a, um, a client that I'm working with or a new client that I'm working with. 
that called me and, and for those of you who are in mortgage in mortgage or if you sell mortgage loans you will understand what I'm talking about and you'll relate to this topic because we have you know we have this stigma in our industry where clients are just wired to look for the lowest rate they look for the lowest cost and it's basically the fault of marketing it's the fault of competitive marketing and 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 of course it's the easiest way to attract consumers is say hey I got something for free and this is why if you're ever at Costco or or one of these wholesale stores you see that huge welfare line by the free you know the free hummus <laughs> like people go nuts bro like I, I can't stand going into Costco because you know it's like walking in traffic and and man like god forbid that they give out some free samples because like you get trampled man like it's it's no joke but anyway competitive marketing creates like this this attraction because it it gives things for free or markets things for free and so naturally consumers are wired to just look for no costs right as if as if companies operate in this world for free Right? Um, you know they're looking for the lowest rates and oftentimes they're looking for the rates that no longer exist especially in today's market and so today's market is obviously higher and you know you don't even need to work in the industry to see in the news that the interest rates are up and so I had a client that called me uh, or actually I called them and I did an outbound call right and if you don't have an outbound script that that's effective like you and you're just relying on a dialer I got a gift for you um, under the, this video, in the notes of this video, where I type out the little description of what the video is about, underneath that, there's a link to salesremastered.com. Or just go to salesremastered.com. Again, salesremastered.com. And at the bottom of the homepage, there's going to be a section where you can request a sales script. I call it Sales Script Remastered. And it gives you verbatim, it gives you a script that you could use with both inbound leads and also outbound. Outbound is probably the absolute strongest, you know, li liable or likely uh, lead to convert right now because you have somewhat control of who you're talking to. Whereas a dialer is gonna be connecting you with people who are on bank rate or lending tree, right? Like these internet inquiries with like these A-type personalities that again just want that believe that they deserve the red carpet and sometimes they do because they have flawless credit they have you know what I mean like a 1% DTI or DTI's debt to income ratio right and they have more equity than you you need to qualify and uh, and the problem is though is that if you're if you're spending your time with someone like that clearly it's gonna be hard to serve them value and so you want to be efficient with your time right and so this script shows you how to be efficient with your time anyway going back to the subject I came. I was. Uh, I was doing um, some outbound dials on leads that I knew were currently in FHA loans, and I came across a lead that had a 3.625 interest rate. Now I clearly know that this prospect's going to say, "Well, you know, today's market interest rate's going to be higher than my 3.625," and so. But but what I wanted to do was position myself as a consultant and a professional to say, "Ah, well, actually, 3.625 is your note rate." but you have a 0.85 uh, for mortgage insurance. So FHA takes 0.85 uh, every month of your loan amount and, 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 and keeps it just in case you foreclose. Like the, you know, the lender is going to be insured by FHA. Basically, you're getting government assistance just in case you default. And um, you know, if that's not your plan, then I don't think you necessarily need to pay mortgage insurance. But more importantly, that 0.85 mortgage insurance actually makes your 3.625 rate uh, a 4.5 roughly right and for those of you who are losing me basically what what I'm doing is I'm just educating them that they don't necessarily have the rate that they believe what their actual rate was was about four and a half and the reason why I do this is because the average market interest rate for someone like this is about five five and a quarter you know I even say five and a half and so when you got a difference or the the consumers perception of 3.625 to market rate which let's say five uh, five and a half they believe there's a two-point spread right <clears throat> but if I position myself properly and educate them that their note rate plus their MI rate actually puts them at four and a half then my sale is just to uh, explain that 1% difference it removes half the battle it's kind of like um, you know when you're when you're selling closing costs like it's another objection right like you're selling closing costs and 
and the prospect believes that uh, that they're you know you might have said hey you know we, we have this complimentary offer and this is within my sales script we have this complimentary offer where we show you no lender fees <clears throat> but you know the prospect hears one thing at the very beginning right the prospect hears no lender fees and so your lender fee could be let's say a thousand bucks but your total closing cost could be three thousand right and so and so when they hear no lender fees, they believe there's no fees, period. Like there's no title, no escrow, no appraisal, whatever. And uh, sometimes that can, just like marketing, will, will attract so that they can disarm their guard and give you a little bit more time. And you need to be creative about that. So try that out. But when it gets down to it, you say, hey, you know what? Just like I said, no lender fees. Here's $1,000 lender credit to go towards your $3,000 closing costs. Get it? And so now they're like, oh, you know what? I, uh, I, did, I thought there was no fees. Yeah, no worries about all the service and the solutions and, and the help that I'm giving you. What would this be worth to you? You know, and you find out it's like, oh, it'd be worth maybe 1500. Okay. So, so what I, what I, <laughs> so basically since your cost is 2000, really the issue is that extra 500 bucks. Does that make sense? So, so when you identify their true reason like why, what they don't find value in or what they disagree with, that's how you get past that, uh, well, let me think about it. Because again, usually when you get up to a sales presentation and you go through the information, typically it's about 30 plus minutes, like you put time into it to uh, craft that message. And if you're like, yo, D, I didn't really put any time into it, well, that's where you're going wrong <laughs> to begin with, right? Sometimes you just gotta be, you gotta be smart. It, you know, sales is chess, it's not checkers, it's not one up, right? A lot of salesmen are playing sales like checkers, like, oh yeah, we're better than them because we got this, like one upper. Where really, it's about chess. You gotta position yourself to be the solution. You have to position yourself to be the vehicle that they will use to reach the, the, the goal that they have in mind. And so when you go through your presentation or whatnot, and the next time that one of your prospects tells you, oh, you know what, everything sounds great, but go ahead and send me the information when my husband or when my wife gets home, I'll talk, we'll talk about it, you know, and then I'll give you a call if we decide to move forward. Number one, I wanna take a step back. And if you're getting that common response, like that's the reason why you're not making sales, is because your prospects are telling you, oh, you know what, I, okay, well, let me go and talk to my spouse about it, or you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the information that you're gonna send me, and me and my spouse are gonna talk about it, um, or you know when my husband or my wife gets home. So number one is is you again re referring to chess is the way to position yourself to avoid most of the objections you're gonna reach at the end of your presentation. You have to pay mind to it, right? You have to take note to it, and 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 focus on like okay, well if I constantly get this objection, what's one thing that I can do to to remove that objection. And one, one thing that I found is that you simply position yourself by saying, hey, what time is your spouse, or if you know that there's a, another party involved in the decision making, you know, what time is that person gonna be there? Or what time is that person going to be available for a 10 minute call? I can conference them in. You guys don't need to be in the same location. I'll just bring him in on the call and just in case they have any questions, at least I won't, you know, I'll be available to address those questions. And so that's one way to remove probably one of the most common objections is like, okay, well, you know, my spouse isn't home yet. I'm gonna talk to them when they get home. We're gonna talk about it. Because if you leave it up to that person to reiterate all the information you just went over, it's the chances are very high that they're not gonna remember everything that you went over it, right? And more importantly, when their spouse who's, it's basically the blind leading the blind. So when that spouse has a question, the, you know, that person you just pitched, they won't know how to answer it. And you need to be there, you need to be present. So it's kind of like poker, you don't wanna show your cards until you know you're in the best position, right? Um, meanwhile, you wanna play smart, you wanna be strategic and say, okay, well I, need, I, I can't give you too much information because then you're going to explain it incorrectly to the, to the other decision maker and now I've just sacrificed the entire time. So be very considerate of that. And then, um, but otherwise, you know, when you get to the end, let's say you pitch both of them, or let's say there's only one decision maker, and and that person still says, okay, well, let me go ahead and you know, let me go ahead and think about it. Everything sounds good, everything sounds great, but let me go ahead and think about it. The primary goal, the 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 main way to to make a sale is at, when you come across that objection is to remember three things, right? Uh, when you're doing a, a presentation or a pitch, this is this is when you go when you go from from marketing to you know the application and then 
uh, conversation and then into selling and then right before you go into a close, right? There's that sequential order. Because uh, you never should start closing at the very beginning. You should, you, should, you should position yourself properly where you transition from selling into closing. And so when you transition from selling into closing, you're, you're thinking of three things. Number one is why they should. Number two is why they shouldn't. And then number three is why not. Why not is only if you come across that objection of, okay, well, let me think about it. And the reason for that is because why you should is because you're, you're basically um, giving them an analysis of all the information that you've, you've gathered, right, through the conversation. And saying, you know, in this in this example of my of my particular client, there, uh, there, you know, what I had gathered, even though they had three point six two five, and my conventional rate was four point eight seven five, which is, uh, you know, almost a, a full point higher than what they had. Um, there, what I had gathered was that they also had credit card debt, they had lack of cash flow, they had no money in the bank at the end of the month. Um, the 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 basically. The, the monthly budget was running into a deficit and my client works two jobs and my client relies on uh, tips in order just to make the bills, right? I wouldn't have gotten that if I, if I would have tried to pitch at the very beginning, but I was asking the right questions and so I gathered all this leverage and then I found out that every month there's no money left or sometimes there's a deficit, which thus then they put onto the credit cards and the credit card balances are going up and their FICO score is going down and their whole goal is to retire in five years. And so I gathered all this information and, and so basically I, I stated that because of, of you know everything you've explained to me and this is the why you should, um, what I what I am gonna do is put the information together, but hey, I got an idea. You know, considering that every single month you're running at, at a deficit or or basically like a, a, a break even, whatever income comes in, you know, immediately goes out and there's nothing left for you, there's nothing left for your retirement, there's nothing left to, to aggressively pay down the, the principal on your credit cards. I I'm I'm fearful that, you know, the only way the only direction you're gonna go is bankruptcy. You know, what, what I, what I, what I want to do is I want to present a solution to you to at least remove the mortgage insurance that you have on your loan so that you can repurpose that mortgage insurance and actually put it to where it counts, whether it's your bank account, whether it's other debt or whether it's towards your principal and interest. You see, I believe that right now by juggling too many, too much debt, you're, you're, there's nothing left for you. And, and unfortunately, you have to rely on two jobs, but more importantly, uh, rely on tips. Not everybody tips. There's a lot of people that, that are gladly not to tip. And so they'll relate and she related and it's like, yeah, yeah, you know, a lot of people don't tip. So then, then I had the hook, right? And so now I've explained why they should, you know, proceed with this idea. And then, um, and then what would, and then the second one is, you know, why you shouldn't. Um, why you why you shouldn't think about it is what I'm referring to, not why you shouldn't buy. Um, but I wanted to again position myself just in case they believe oh, when they're thinking in their head like oh why I shouldn't make a decision now. Well, my goal is through my verbiage and through my delivery is to explain why they shouldn't wait, right? So you know the goal was to remove them from from the FHA loan and into a conventional loan before the market rate goes up any higher and then I am not able to save them as much as I could save them today the more that I'm able to save them the faster that they can get rid or out from under this high revolving debt and therefore start re repurposing some cash flow and create cash flow to put towards retirement to put towards the bank with dependents in the house and, and two people relying uh, on, on you know, three sources of income just to get by, the question is, you know, what if one of your dependents have an unexpected bill? What if, what if there's a maintenance bill in the house? The only thing that you have to resort to are the credit cards and I looked at the credit card limits and you're already at its max. With the likelihood of you being approved to open up another credit line with this low FICO score, you're running out of choices. So what I want to do is put a solution and put out the fire before it erupts and burns everything. So here's my idea, and that's the reason why you know why you shouldn't. And then uh, and so the idea then goes into the pitch and the close. And of course they said, oh well, send me some information. I want to think about it because all, they couldn't get around the idea of going from a 3.625 FHA rate to a 4.875 conventional. You know, they're like, man, that's just that's a one and a quarter point higher. You know, they couldn't get past that. 
And so they were like, okay, well, let me go ahead and think about it. And so then my response was, no, I completely get it. You know, it's very hard to understand, especially if you don't, you know, work in this industry. But, you know, fortunately I do. And I, I'm looking at a system that's very advanced. I have about 900 calculators within this system. So if you have any questions, feel free to give me a call. But, you know, looking at the information, understanding that there really is no alternative, I understand you want to think about it. But, but at the end of the day, if, if you wanted to think about finding a solution and I presented you a solution, what would you have to think about? Because the only alternative right now is to run out of resources, is to wait even longer when the market rate goes up and then s sacrifice the lower rate and the lower payment that's available today. You see, my fear is that like some that I come across, some that I talk to, is is that they're so caught up on this interest rate that they're willing to forego their livelihood, their security. Um, they're willing to kind of continue juggling and struggling just to protect the number that they believe they have. Now I'm telling you, this 3.625 is your note rate, but actually at four and a half. You see, I'm only I'm I'm only at 4.875. So yeah, there's a 0 0.3 difference. But in exchange, what would it feel like to give you yourself a surge of cash flow, put some money in the bank, pay off the debts, and create a, th a $300 payment monthly monthly payment savings? And where I got that savings was um, they would come across like an escrow refund, um, uh, a payment deferral, and $1,999 at close, right? Because that can continues to keep it as rate term. And so with all this money, they were able to pay off credit cards, which I found which I found out they were paying like $500 towards. So when they rid the credit cards, then I add that $500 savings to my pitch, and now I'm actually saving them month to month, right? So yeah, I can open up $300 a monthly savings. How, how would that feel if you had $300 extra per month? That's more than you make in tips, right? So what if you, what if you had this much cash flow without any debt, and you're able to actually see money in your bank? Right, so now I'm, I'm, I'm explaining. So, so I understand that you want to think about having peace of mind, but how much longer can you can you continue this struggle? So, here's what what I know for doing this as long as I, I I have been. Typically, when people say they want to think about it, it's because they don't understand something. So, let me ask you this question. You know, on a scale of one through ten, right? Ten being I need the solution. This is this is this is the, this is what's going to help me. This is right for me. Um, uh, that being a 10 or, or zero being, you know what, I, I like the struggle, I don't want any help. Where are you, right? And then they have to think about it, like, mm, well, I don't want, I don't like the struggle, so, you know, I'll be a, a seven, right? And, and so there's, they're a little bit close to saying, yes, this is the right solution for me, but I just want them to realize that they're far away from saying, no, this is not right for me because they don't want the struggle. And so if they say seven and then I'll ask them, I'll say, okay, what, what would it take to bring you to a 10? Right. And so then they'll tell you like, uh, well, you know what? I, I just don't understand um, going back to a 30 year term. Right. And you say, OK, well, I get it. You've been in your, your loan for two years. So heaven forbid you, you know, you go back to a 30 year term. But here's the thing is that after we work on you and we give yourself a chance to rehabilitate your credit score, to replenish your monthly savings and to rebuild the foundation that you 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 have right now that's unfortunately crumbling because there's nothing else to rely on there's no, you're running out of resources everything is kind of breaking so if we don't establish a solid foundation you're going to continue chipping away at resources that are running out which in this case are your credit cards and your credit card limit there's nothing in the bank so we're just relying on debt so it's constantly peter to paul Peter to Paul. You're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Does that make sense? And so, and so the idea is if if we can make it a 10, what does that look like to you? It's like, oh well, I don't I don't want to go back to a 30. Got it. Here's an idea. Let's work on you first. In 12 months, we're gonna analyze your situation again, and I'm gonna show you how to go to a 25-year term. So you're not going backwards. I'm actually show you how to shed years off the life of your loan. But at that time, you're gonna have X amount of dollars in the bank, you're gonna have a much higher FICO, more equity because of the, you know, where your property is located. But more importantly, when we talk about shedding years off the life of your loan, I'm actually shedding a couple years, like three years off your life, right? So if they're 28 years now, one year, they should theoretically be 27, and then I brought them down to, let's say, a 25, 
or even a 20, I'm still saving them uh, years off the life of the loan. Does that make sense? But the key is though, let's work on them before they decide to take on Goliath or before they focus on the big kahuna, which is the mortgage debt. And so that is ultimately what you're doing is you're just finding out what reason they need to think about it. And typically when they say they need to think about it, it's because they simply do not understand. There's, there's something that you're missing. They don't find value in something. And, and, and in this particular scenario, it was that small thing. Like they would have paid the closing costs, right? And they did, or they are, right? Like they're gonna pay all the closing costs, no lender credit, but they, their, their qualm was going from 28 years to 30 years. So they're worried about going backwards. You see, I would have assumed it would have been interest rate. I would have assumed, you know, being, being uh, inexperienced, I would have assumed that it was because of the closing costs or it was because of the interest rate. But no, it wasn't that. Like they, they're cool with that because the benefits outweighed the, um, the difference. But what it was was just adding two years off the back to life alone. But I wouldn't have known that if I did not find out what their true reason was. So in it, my, my solution to you is the next time you come across, let me think about it, accept it, don't get defensive, and just try to pinpoint exactly what they don't understand and what they agree with because the second that you disconnect and accept that reason is the last time you'll hear from them. So I hope that this video helps you. Comment below, let me know what your greatest takeaway was. And I got a question for you. Um, with the information that I've shared with you thus far, how has it impacted you? How has it helped you in your sales? Please do me one solid and comment below. Let me know how this information has helped you. And uh, definitely uh, subscribe, click the bell, like, share, and comment. And uh, if you take the video link and you share it to someone else on your team, at least they could find a resource so that they're not caught up with the same objection and you guys can both climb the ranks together. I'll see you in the next video. Bye. This is how the punk talk and get to it. Oh, look at him. Rip hard, really do a part. Look at him. We can buy the boy all night.